Today we're going to compare these two gas furnaces. On this side, I have an 80% AFUE gas furnace. Of the gas that I buy, I convert 80% of that to heat the house. 20% is going to go right at this flue pipe. On this side, we have what we call a 90 plus condensing furnace. There's many different styles of this, but it's over 90% of the gas that I burn turns to heat to heat the house. The last little bit is going to go out the flue pipe, in this case, which is going to be PVC. This particular model is a 94.1% efficient gas furnace, and they have these all the way up to 98% efficient, which I find absolutely fascinating. Of, of the gas that you buy, 98% goes to heat the house, and the last little 2% is going to go out the flue pipe, which is just absolutely fascinating to me. So there's a lot of similarities, but more so a lot of differences in this technology to get that last little bit of heat out of here. So we're going to break these down. Now, this furnace has a standard metal flue pipe. It's usually aluminum, some kind of metal inside of here, and the flue pipe has to be hot. It has to be a certain temperature. If we take too much heat out of this flue gas, it'll actually start to condensate. Condensation will end up running down this flue pipe, and it'll eat away the pipe itself. It'll also eat away the fan, and it'll heat, eat away the heat exchanger inside. This furnace is a condensing furnace. So this furnace, we get so much heat out of that, that condensation is dealt with by having PVC. We've also taken so much heat out of that flue gas, the gas is cool enough, we can run it inside this PVC. So it has to be this PVC because as we take the condensation out of the gas, we also end up with other types of chemicals and leftover components of combustion, and that becomes very acidic. So we drain all this back into this gas furnace, and this gas furnace has a drain line that has to be run in the wintertime. And here we have the drain line on the furnace. Now this is very important. Now on this drain line, you'll see sometimes people try to run this drain line outside the house, and it works great most of the time until it gets below freezing outside. Then that drain line freezes up, the water backs up in the furnace, we can't fire the burners, and all of a sudden now we don't have heat anymore. So you can drain this most of the time, most city code allows you to drain it into the drain, but they'll usually require some kind of a neutralizer. Because the condensation of this will be very acidic, there's a neutralizer that we put inside of here that can cause that to not eat away the pipes, which is a nice bonus. So we talked about the drain, or sorry, the drain. This one doesn't have a drain. If it's draining water, we have a huge issue. This furnace is going to be a big problem. Difference between the flue pipe being metal and the flue pipe being PVC. Now let's talk about combustion air. And anytime we burn anything, we need oxygen to burn with. And the oxygen that we use is from the air. This furnace gets its combustion air from the air around it. I lost a door for this furnace, but it would be having louvered doors on it, meaning the metal would be cut and turned inward, similar to like a return air grill. That air is coming from the closet space around it, and that's what we're using to burn the burners down here, burn the gas in those burners. Now, where do we get that combustion air? In this closet, it's going to come from what we call upper and lower combustion air. This closet would have to have a hole either coming from the attic up high or out through a side wall up high, and another pipe coming down low if it's from the attic or cut into the wall down low. This is the air, so we're getting air from outside or from the attic, which also gets from outside so that we can burn this burner. Now, the air from the house is completely separate. Down in this compartment, we have our blower. So we keep our blower and the air from the house completely sealed and separated. The heat exchanger keeps these combustion gases completely separate. So the air from the house never mixes with this air. The idea is if we have a car carbon monoxide leak, we're not causing it to um, draft into the house. Also, that we're not pulling, burning all the oxygen out of the house. So it's very important that we have the combustion air. I've seen people install furnaces without the proper combustion air and actually blew the closet door off of the furnace closet and stuck to the wall on the other side. It's also caused fires and many people have gotten hurt from that. So code is very specific requiring combustion air for these furnaces. This furnace has a really cool solution to that. What this furnace is using is it's actually bringing the combustion air directly from outside. We have one pipe for the flue gas, but we have another pipe going outside where we bring those combustion gases directly from outside. So all the air that we're going to burn, we're pulling it from outside, we're burning those flue gases, and then we're exhausting that gas right back outside. So none of the air from this furnace mixes with the air of the house, which is absolutely fantastic. You can install this furnace right in the living room, although it may not look the greatest, I kind of like the look, uh, it wouldn't have to have the issues of having combustion air. Now, another big point of that is nowadays we're sealing houses. We're foaming them to make them much more energy efficient, which is absolutely wonderful. Now, when we foam houses, we also foam the attic, the rafters all the way up to the top. If we had this furnace installed in the attic, 
I wouldn't have anywhere to get combustion gases from. If it was in a closet and the, com and the combustion air went into the attic, there still would be no place to get oxygen from the burn. So if we had a foamed house, we wouldn't be able to use this gas furnace. We would have to switch over to this furnace, to where this furnace is getting all of its combustion air directly from outside. So some great benefits for this furnace. Not only is it more energy efficient, and also we don't have to worry about the combustion air factor, and that's less heat we're having inside the house in the summertime when we're not using the furnace. Now on these furnaces, the 90 plus furnaces are required in the northeast. Think about the northeast, we have more heating, more time that we're gonna have to run this furnace. So we have more miles, so to speak, on this furnace. So this furnace needs to get a better miles per gallon, what we call AFUE, annual fuel utilization efficiency. So this furnace is getting the best efficiency out of that gas. So in the northeast, they require it to be at least 90% efficiency. And the south and southeast, you can still buy this 80% AFUE gas furnace. Now, they have more of a cooling season. They don't require as much of a heating load, so they still allow these gas furnaces. They're not, they're not being ran as much. They're not being put as many miles on, so to speak, on this furnace. So these are the differences, big differences between these two furnaces. Also, one more thing I want to talk about is this furnace has a full sealed door, but if we open this door up, we're going to see some, quite a few differences inside of this furnace. Here we can see this is our combustion chamber. So our fresh air, or combustion air, is going to be piped directly into this box. I can't physically touch the burners, the gas, or the air coming into it. Then from their inducer fan, we're going to force that draft back outside. Whereas this furnace is all open. Here's my manifold where my gas is going to flow. It mixed with primary air right here. Secondary air is around it. You can access everything. The inducer fan motor pulls it out. So by having this 90 plus furnace, it simplifies all of those effects. Now I have seen people that installed these furnaces and they left the intake pipe open to the closet, which I find that it really de defeats a lot of the benefits of this furnace. If you do that, then you still have to go back to the upper and lower combustion air and there's a whole lot of other requirements for that. I like to have that pipe piped directly outside. Now I've talked with some people that they have reasons that they don't like to do that and it can be argued for the end of time. Uh, but really, if you follow all the installation instructions, you're going to be fine. Now, on those installation instructions, these furnaces, if you notice, there's a lot more components inside. They run a lot more efficiency and a lot more precise. So when you install these furnaces, you have to follow that installation guide, and you have to read every step through there. How many elbows you can use, the angle of the pipe, how much slope you have, which way it slopes is all important. Every time I've gone to a customer that had a 90 plus furnace that wasn't working right, I found out that they had installation issues. So we solved those installation issues and these furnaces run really, really great with the proper maintenance. So these furnaces here, this one is a 100,000 BTU furnace. This furnace, and that's input, so this is a 100,000 BTU input. That means it's 80,000 BTU output for the house. So if I was to buy this furnace, you'd buy it as a 100,000 BTU, but in reality it's an 80,000 BTU because that extra 20% is going to have the flue pipe. This furnace has two ratings. On high heat, it's a 66,000 BTU furnace. So it's a little over uh, half the size of this furnace. 61,000 BTU is gonna heat the house. What's also cool about this furnace is it's a two-stage gas furnace. So it also is a 45,000 BTU input gas heating and a 43,000 BTU going to heat the house. So if you figure the time in the spring and the fall, it's where the weather is, you need heating, but it's not a massive amount of heat. We can run on low fire. We can heat the house. We can have longer run times, and you have less swing in the house. Instead of this, this furnace coming on, heating all at once, the house gets warm, then it cools off too much, then it gets warm, and it's on and off, on and off. This furnace will run on a lower setting, nice and continuous, and give you an even amount of heat. Then when those really, really cold days hit, the furnace goes into its high fire and we're using the full capacity of this heater. So to make that furnace work on that, we have a few extra components we have to have. In other words, our inducer fan motor now is a two-speed motor. This guy just turns on and run. It's single speed. Here we have a two-speed motor. Now the IFC needs to know for sure that this motor is on low speed when we have low fire. The engineers have designed the size of the, the speed of the motor and the size of the holes here to pull a precise amount of air. So our accommodation gas valve is going to open a precise amount. Now to make sure the air and the fuel mix correctly, the IFC needs to know that this motor is working correct and on the correct speed. So here we have low pressure switches. When it's on low fire, this motor is running on low speed. Only this low pressure switch closes. Only the low side of the solenoid valve opens for the gas to flow. 
Once we call for high speed, then this motor kicks onto the high speed, the full RPMs. This one stays closed, but now in addition, these close. Now the IFC knows that these pressure switches set for a higher amount of vacuum is closed and we're safe to open the gas valve to full fire. Now the gas valve's second solenoid opens and will allow the full amount of gas to flow into the manifolds through the spuds and orifices, mixing with the primary air and igniting into a flame inside this heat exchanger. So by having those two different stages, it makes this furnace not necessarily more efficient, but operating more comfortably. It's still, it takes so many BTUs to heat the house, whether you're running that for 30 minutes or an hour, it's still the same amount of BTUs, except by having it longer running time at a lower rate, more comfortable, and it makes the furnace last longer without all the on and off cycling. On the bottom door of both of these furnaces is where we would have our IFCs and our blower motors. So if we open this guy up right here, we have our IFC and our blower motor that's pushing the air through the heat exchanger and into the house. And we have the similar aspect over here in this furnace, except I don't have the IFC on this particular furnace, the blower motor, so it's pulling air from the bottom through the heat exchanger and into the house. There's some very big differences I want to point out in these heat exchangers. So we're going to turn these to the side so you can see what's going on. This gas furnace, we have our burners at the bottom. So our flame burns right about to this point right here. Then it's just the hot gas is going back and forth, back and forth. And the exhaust, the flue, the indu inducer fan motor is pulling or inducing that flame to burn sideways. The rest of it's just the hot gases. This heat exchanger also squeezes and gets narrower and narrower towards the top. And also these little rivets. What we're trying to do is squeeze, so to speak, the last little bit of heat out. In reality, it's surface area. We're making more of the gases touch more of the metal so that we get more of the heat from the metal to the air of the house. So that's how this furnace is working. We're pulling, inducing the flame sideways, goes back and forth, and we exhaust it out. Now this furnace is on loan from Superior Services in San Angelo, Texas. I got to return this furnace to them, so I'm able to cut a hole in the side of it. Now remember I take classes in HVAC and I learn about HVAC, I don't take art classes. So this is my drawing of what's happening on the side. Now if you stay tuned in a future video, we're going to pull this heat exchanger out and talk about it so you can see exactly how it looks. Until then you're just going to have to bear with us. This heat exchanger, we have the combustion chamber where the fire is going to be at the very, very top. It's still burning horizontally. Remember, that's an inducer draft motor, inducing or pulling a draft through this heat exchanger. The flames burn out, and now we still have these hot gases. These hot gases are being pulled by that inducer fan motor across, and then we squeeze it down to smaller and smaller tubes so I can get as much heat out of that heat exchanger as possible. From then, I go down here to a nice little collection box, and I hit a secondary heat exchanger. This secondary heat exchanger is one of the key important components of these 90 plus condensing furnaces. It separates into a whole lot of little bitty bitty tubes running through. So that gives us even more surface area. More of the gases are touching even more of the piping. On top of that, we have aluminum fins on here, which looks just like an evaporator coil. These aluminum fins transfer heat from the pipes to the aluminum, to the air, even more efficiently. So we're getting a massive amount of heat transfer. So then we collect all the gases together and it's flowing out the flue pipe, that PVC flue pipe. So with this furnace, because I'm now having condensation going on here, I've taken so much heat out of that gas that we're actually having condensation. So this secondary heat exchanger is actually made of stainless steel. So it can withhand, withheld all of that acidic and all that moisture in there. So this heat exchanger here is what's making most of this furnace happen. It's what's the magic behind it. Now, if we think about this furnace, the flames are the hot part of my heat exchanger. Down here, there's not nearly as much heat. The heat going into this is about the same temperature as I'm, as I'm losing, losing on this 80% gas furnace. But because I separate that and it's a lower temperature, the air, the cooler air, is now still transferring heat. Let's say this temperature is about 85 degrees and the air temperature is 80, 70 degrees. Well, 70 degree air is going to gain heat from this 85 degree temperature heat exchanger. Then we're going to heat up even more when we hit the hotter parts, and we're going to heat up even more as we hit the hotter parts. And now that the air is touching where the flames are, it gets even more heat. So now I've gained a ton of heat out of this furnace from the heat exchanger being upside down, so to speak, and from that secondary coil. Now, a lot of new techs get confused. They say, how can you burn your flame upside down? And on both these furnaces, we're not burning the flame upside down. We're inducing or burning the flame horizontally with the horizon, and here I'm also still burning it horizontally. 
The rest of it is just how I'm pulling those gases through. Now to deal with that moisture, we have to take into account some other specifications. In this case, my inducer fan motor has a composite plastic type housing. This housing is able to handle the moisture and the acidicness. The blade lower wheel inside of here is also a plastic composite type material, where this one is metal. If I tried using this housing on here, it would rust away in no time. There's also drain point points from the housing here, from the secondary heat exchanger, and multiple locations to make sure we properly get rid of the condensation on there. Now, both of these furnaces are multiple different, multiple positional. This furnace can be upright or horizontal. In other words, an upflow, the air is going up or horizontal. This furnace cannot be used as a downflow. This furnace is a multi-poise or a multi-positional furnace. It can be used as an upflow furnace horizontal right, horizontal left, or even a downflow. And what they do is have these different configurations preset for you. So you can, if you read the instructions, it tells you exactly how we can do that, but they give you different ports so I can move the drain in different locations, plug the locations I'm not using, and use this for tons of different options. It also gives me the convenience of having the air intake on either side. I plug the one I'm not using and the exhaust for either side, and I plug the one I'm not using. So it's absolutely fabulous in these furnaces. Now, a lot of people look at this and they get scared because there's all these extra components here. But really, if you break it down to what you're looking at, it's not so scary. I got a two-stage motor and my pressure switch ensures that I'm on low speed. This pressure switch is stores I'm on high speed. My combination gas valve, I have just like this one's a single, except here I have a double. I'm able to adjust the gas pressure in low fire and again on high fire. I still have my manifold. I still have to mix it with primary air, with the gas and the burners. They still have to go across an ignition source. They still have to ignite into a flame. Those flames still have to burn inside my heat exchanger, which keeps it separate from the air in the house. And I still have to have the blower motor moving the air across. Both of these have to have some type of an ISC controlling all those components. The rest of it, you can just follow your schematic and it tells you exactly what it is you're looking for. The cool thing about these new furnaces is it's gonna have a little blinking light or a little LED telling you or guiding you to what's wrong with it. So if you follow the installation instructions, when you get to the house, first thing I do is look for that blinking light. Now, if you get into the instructions on it, you can go through and it'll help you diagnose what's happening. On a lot of these units, it'll actually have a fault code reading on the inside the door. Now, I tell you to write down that blinking light first because once you take this door off, this door safety switch, the door interlock, is gonna reset the power to the control board and you lose all of those codes. So it's very important for you to get that light. How many blinks are happening in that furnace before you take that door off? Other than that, it's just simple following the wiring schematics. Quite a simple furnace, extremely efficient, nothing to be scared of. Learn about them, practice them, go through your sequence of operation. These furnaces here are quite uh, robust. A lot of safety components. We still have flame rollouts, we still have primary limits. Both these furnaces compared to those old gas furnaces are so much better. This one, however, is my favorite.